Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Digital Data Podcast. I'm Cecilia Maundu. I'm a broadcast journalist. I'm a digital security trainer. And I'm also a podcaster. I work at the intersection of journalism, human rights, and technology. And today we have a guest. I'd say this conversation, we are taking it global. And my guest is from South Africa. And I would like her to introduce herself because I might, first of all, butcher her name. And I might not do justice. So allow me. Hi. Welcome to Digital Data Podcast. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you so much for making the time with your crazy schedule. No, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm tremendously grateful. Yes. So kindly introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and you are where you are in our country. Uh, my name is Lindio Mazibugo. Mm-hmm. I am from South Africa. I am the co-founder and CEO of an organization called Future Elect. Um, we're a political and leadership development and training program for young Africans who want to run for office. Mm-hmm. We have been running programs in the SADC region since 2018, uh, and we are finally launching in East Africa, which is why I'm here today, um, to announce the launch of the program um, and to engage with organizations in civil society and politics and government and business um, about what the specificities are of the challenges around political leadership in this region. Yeah. Congratulations, like such a great milestone. And you know, like in our continent, like when women are in politics, it's such a big deal because it's such a rough, rough terrain. Yeah. And when we see young women like you, we know there's so much hope. And today being International Day for IC, women, uh, girls in ICT, mm. when girls look at people like you, they're like, oh, there's so much hope for them. So thank you so much again for having the time to sit with me. So my first question, I'm just curious to find out what is um, the future of the internet in connection with future elect? Because we know that politics has gone digital, you mm-hmm. know, like if there's anything COVID-19 underscored is the importance of the internet. Absolutely. Yes. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, it affects everything from voter registration and even in some countries voting um, all the way through to political campaigns Uh, If you're in a political party, it affects uh, your party conferences, how you pass resolutions and how you how you vote for party leaders. Um, And crucially for women specifically, when all of these things are happening online, it creates a new opening for political violence, uh, marginalization, threats um, to safety and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, uh, digital um, communication has become an unavoidable um, part of of the political sphere, um, but what I like about it is it's it's enabled perhaps people who didn't necessarily have the resources to charter helicopters and fly up and down the country exactly. campaigning to reach greater audiences um, and to inspire more individuals to consider political participation if they hadn't done so before. Yeah, so there's something you mentioned uh, during the panel and you've also talked about it, which brings me to my second question. Uh, Now that you have Future Elect, how are you training uh, these women to know that the violence has moved online now, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and the most vulnerable are women politicians, Mm -hmm. women journalists, women basically who have voices online Mm -hmm. and the cohort that you're training, there are women who are going to have voices online. Mm -hmm. How are you preparing them for this eventually? Because it will definitely happen. You know, it is the new frontier for violence. Because again, the digital platform has given us a level playing field. Mm. Unlike before, whereby we felt like the men are have have more voices. Now we actually have the voices. So how are you preparing them for this eventuality? Yeah, look, one of our audience members today was very um, insightful. She pointed out that backlash is a consequence of progress. Yes. So the reason women are facing backlash in these spaces, including online, is because they're raising their voices, and that's a good thing. So how do we combat the backlash? How do we protect women who are running for elected office? Um, uh, Frankly, they're the ones who end up having to make those decisions once they become legislators, Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Um, And that's one of the reasons, you know, choosing the most talented, you know, the most people-centered, the most ethical leaders in all our societies is essential because these are the people who are going to make decisions about how the criminal justice system in its entirety, but specifically with relation to online violence, threats of violence, the the dissemination of private information in order to cause harm, how all of these things affect women and even women in politics is actually the purview of politicians. So, we, you know, it's a twofold uh, challenge. We've got to support 
uh, are the people who do our programs to engage with the best policymakers in this area so that when they go into legislatures, uh, senates and so forth and they're making decisions about laws and regulations, they're doing it from a pr place of knowledge. Um, I don't know if you recall, but um, in the recent past, you would have seen CEOs of tech companies co you know, pr coming to Congress and the House of Commons exactly. and being asked, like, why, why won't my account let me sign out or whatever, <laughs> right, in the middle of a senatorial, um, you know, interrogation. So... We also need young people to be craft competent in this space. And so there's a there's a technical capacity space. And then there's also, you know, before you even get to be a legislator, before you even get to be a regulator, part of the public service, um, how are you managing the heat that is generated by you having a voice um, online? And I think the injunction for us as an organization is to make sure women are aware of these threats, um, that we are able to build a network of people who can give advice, who can assist with prosecutions if necessary, who can, who can assist with advice about managing security and particularly online security, um, just to put women candidates in the midst of this backlash in the best possible position they can be to be successfully elected to office. Okay, another question that I have is the future of democracies on the digital platforms, mm -hmm. you know. This, this, these digital platforms have been created for business. I keep saying Mark Zuckerberg didn't just wake up to create Facebook so that he can give information. He's yeah. there to make money. Yeah. So what can we do to also bring them to account because this violence taking place on their platform. Mm -hmm. We've seen the keys, uh, a recent case of TikTok in the US. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to bring them into account. Mm -hmm. So what can we do knowing that we are from the global south, mm -hmm. a, a word I don't like saying, we are from the global south and mm -hmm. sometimes we feel like we are disadvantaged especially when we feel like we need to raise our voices to these tech companies yeah. who are also some of the biggest funders of some of the things that we do yeah yes. no it's it's an incredibly important question i mean facebook google these are all advertising companies exactly. they don't exist to give us a voice they don't exist to make you know societies better there could be a spin-off effect of that but there's also an opposite spin-off effect which is violence and disinformation and so there's a lot that can be you know, uh, distilled down from a from society's challenges into the online space. Yes. Um, it's not a force for good or evil. It's a force for replicating what we do offline. So how do we make sure that these platforms are accountable? I mean, African legislators and regulators have to be amongst the best in the world to be able to stay abreast of the challenges of doing digital regulation, but also uh, to be sure that they're doing regulation not only of what happens online, but when their countries uh, produce a labor force that works for these companies, exactly. right? So we've heard terrible things about um, the moderators working in Kenya, mm -hmm. working in Southern Africa yes. and elsewhere who are exposed to the most horrific content, right. violence, abuse, are underpaid, are, are you know, forced to work long hours um, under just appalling working conditions. What are our lawmakers, what are our regulators doing to make sure that labor laws are such that our people don't become exploited in order to be turned into the runners of troll farms right. and into moderators of content that shouldn't be seen by, you know, human beings, right? How, how do we make sure we're not opening up our, our citizens to jobs which may seem like exciting opportunities in the technology space, but which are actually an, under, an underpaid form of, of manipulative and exploitative labor. So um, there's a labor issue, there's a content online issue, but both I think intersect. And this is why we operate in the political space at Future Elect. It all ends up in politics. Exactly. It all ends up in elections, in laws, in regulations, all of which are done and um, decided by political leaders. Uh, one layer after that, you've got the civil service, right? A permanent civil service in most countries that implements these decisions, these manifesto pro promises and so forth. But even at the level of accountability, it's parliaments, you know, and legislatures at all levels that are responsible for bringing these companies to account, uh, for drafting laws that will limit their ability to abuse labor or to engage in harmful practices in our jurisdictions. These are our jurisdictions and we get to make the decisions about the standards of care that tech, that tech companies are responsible for. So that is, that is a duty that public um, representatives have and it's certainly something we impress upon our fellows on these programs. I, I like when you talk about them also being the duty that they have. Mm. Another thing, and I don't know if it's, um, it's a cross board or maybe it's a, uh, only unique to Kenya, which I'm sure it's not. You find most of the people in public service, they're still not digitally enabled. And it's most of them, like, uh, 
<coughs> Sorry about that. So you find they're not digitally enabled. Some of them choose to stay away from the digital platform. They're like, oh, this is not for me. But unfortunately, so how will they make decisions about this digital platform yeah. if they're not part of it? So what what can be done to also tell them like they don't have the luxury because most of them are digital, digital natives like mm. ourselves. They're not like the ones who, who, are, who are born were born in the digital era. Yeah. So what can we do also to make them know they don't have the luxury of it? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the challenge of having a politics that's dominated by one age group. Yes. Um, of course, some of the most intelligent, tech-savvy and up-to-date um, you know, political leaders on these issues are in their 60s and 70s. Exactly. It's not a, a rule that only young people understand this technology or are you know, regular users of it. Um, and of course, if you're a responsible legislator, it's there's an opportunity for you to do your research, to get your team to go out and find the information you need so that you can make legislative decisions and you can hold companies to account. But on a continent where most of our politicians cut their teeth during the industrial era, uh, the knowledge economy is difficult mm -hmm. terrain for, for people who don't want to learn and who don't want to upskill themselves for life. So, yeah, that's the benefit of diversity. It's a benefit in the private sector and it's a benefit in the public sector. If you have different generations, different genders, different nationalities, different everything, you bring a variety of life experiences to the table combined with the expertise that those individuals have and the sum is greater than the individual parts. So, you know, part of transforming political leadership for us on the African continent a continent where the average, you know, the the median age is 19 years yeah. old mm -hmm. and the majority are women by mm -hmm. about one million. Um, transforming it is about making it look more like who we are today than, um, than having a politics that's just dominated by one age group and one gender. So for, yeah, for us at Future Elect, it's partially about, you know, the transition of a new generation of political leaders into the space um, to contest for power and then to wield that power in defense of the people by regulating, legislating, and holding uh, the private sector and international uh, businesses to account. Um, but the second piece is also building politics and political spaces on the continent that represent all the different parts of who we are, the young, the older, yeah. um, men and women, you know, people of varying religions and eth ethnic backgrounds and so forth. Diversity is a strength that we should absolutely go for in politics. Yeah. And um, uh, I would like to cycle back to that point you talked about content moderation. Mm. There have been a lot of cries that uh, content moderation is not very... Uh, let me use the word fair. Uh, you find it's more like regulated from the global south and the global north. Also, how, what can we, what can legislators do to bring in such uh, issues into question? Because we're also talking about decolonizing the internet. We want the internet to be for everyone. You know, we don't want to be like we are part of something that was given to us, like mm. of here is a favor. No, we want to feel like part of it. Mm. So, what can we do when it comes to the issue of content moderation? And how, because also content moderation is about freedom of expression. Mm. Yes. Mm. Look, I think every country, every, every jurisdiction has its rules and regulations about freedom of speech, about hate speech, mm -hmm. about what is acceptable legal, legally and constitutionally, what constitutes online violence and hate. Um, and so again, you know, the, the CEO of Facebook famously once said that Facebook is like a country and, you know, its employees should treat it as such. It, well, Facebook is not a country. It's, it's a business a that <laughs> operates in multiple countries mm. and is registered in one. Mm. Um, its responsibility is to apply the rules of each jurisdiction appropriately in order to ensure that it's abiding by local laws. Um, because ultimately, um, you know, the people are the ones who decide on what the parameters of free speech an acceptable speech in a society are because the people are the ones who elect their public representatives and their public representatives write these laws. So constitutions vary from country to country. They vary from region to region. Uh, cultural expectations vary. I think the responsibility of any global business is to respect those differences um, and make sure that that is its first point of departure uh, in terms of how it regulates and how it moderates um, online speech instead of, you know, the whole world being subjected to the rules of the game that happen to be in place in the United States, for example, mm -hmm. or in the United Kingdom or in France. Um, so I think that's a really, really important part. But, but, but having said that, we're also part of an you know, international community and, 
you know, we have things like the UN Charter on Human Rights that, you know, give us baseline indications of what is acceptable speech, behavior, um, and legally, um, you know, defensible interactions. And many of these things have translated into online content. So even at the level of the international, you know, international businesses should have internal standards for how they do this kind of work. They shouldn't just be guided by the law. They should also be guided by ethics and by what, by what they know um, is wrong and right. But you know, the purpose of having political representat representation um, is to offer the kinds of protections um, that countries need uh, from, you know, you know, organizations, institutions that may want to wield a particular kind of outside influence. There's a really, there's a, there's a balance to be struck, mm -hmm. you know, between, um, you know, giving people the freedom to be who they want to be on these platforms, you know, not persecuting individuals yeah, mm -hmm. on arbitrary bases. And I think there's plenty of guidance on, on, the, on these issues in terms of international law and international precedent. But at the same time, there are jurisdictional differences, you know, unique mm -hmm. differences like, you know, how, how you know, what constitutes hate, hate speech in Germany versus what constitutes, you know, hate speech in the US or, you know, hate speech in Rwanda versus, hate, you know, hate speech in Zimbabwe. Like these are different jurisdictions with different histories. And so content moderation has to bear those realities in mind as well. Uh, thank you. Also, when it comes to content moderation is the issue of language. English is not our first language, mm. you know, and we, I don't want to use the word forced, but we've been forced to adopt to this international language. But at the same time, we have to look at um, 10 years from now, especially the children who are coming up, will they ever know there was anything like uh, issues of tribes? Because now they are, everything is being left behind. Also, I would want to know, like in the future elect, when it comes, how, what role does language play? Yes, because we want to speak in a language that also our people can be able to say this is our own. Mm. Yes. So, I mean, uh, language is complicated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, one of the things that people often say about technology is it'll bring about an age where everybody is equal and everybody has you know, you know, the equal opportunity to speak out, et cetera, et cetera. But what we found is that technology often replicates our virtues and our vices. Yes. So there are parts of the world in which technology has caused low-level genocide, you know, mm -hmm. communities, you know, receiving disinformation about one another online um, and resorting to violence in order to address it. Um, one need only look at the United States where, you know, somebody believed a conspiracy theory about the sexual abuse of children and the Democratic Party and they showed up at a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. and started shooting everyone, right? So... You know, the, the internet can be a place where the worst impulses of people can be magnified and then the, their consequences can, you know, um, end up spilling out into into the greater world. So, you know, is 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 technology going to bring about a culture, a, a post-culture utopia? No, it, it can do one of the other. It can do one of the other thing. Yes. It can create a more open society or it can shut it down by balkanizing people into their constituent ethnic groups. Um yeah, and, and then on, uh, sorry, I d uh, can you repeat your second question? Yeah, like what, uh, when it comes to the role of language in future elect? Oh, what, yes. So, I mean, one of the things we teach and that, that we take incredibly seriously on, at, on our programs is the importance of authenticity. Exactly. So we, we don't want people to pretend to be who they're not, um, but we also expect them to respect the intelligence and the agency of the people who, who they hope will one day send them into public office. Um, so we encourage our public representation candidates, you know, people who want to run for office, uh, to be their authentic selves, but to also remember the value of speaking to a person in their own language mm -hmm. um, and respecting cultural difference where it's relevant, but not turning it into an instrument of subjugation exactly. when it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I watched one of your TED Talks and you, in the t talk you were, say, you were talking about, I'm not going un unless you come with me. And we know that the internet has given us the power of digital activism. You mm. know, that's again to my earlier point where I talked about uh, level playing field. So also what, uh, what can future leaders, especially women politicians from this continent, what advantage can they take when it comes to the issue of digital activism? You know, also drawing crowds because going by example of Kenya, this was dubbed, last year was dubbed as a digital election, mm. but there's something that we keep forgetting that 
when you go to the major cities, the internet is, you know, like very good. But what about the bulk of our population who live in the rural areas? Mm. So I also want to know, like, um, what policies can be put into place when it comes to the to the issue of internet accessibility, the issue of digital activism? Yeah, that's a country specific mm -hmm. policy, and I would never dictate mm -hmm. to any country what their policy in this mm -hmm. area should be. That's what the leaders who do these programs should decide for themselves. Yeah. Um, with respect to how people campaign using technology, well, again, technology is not a substitute for real engagement with people. COVID-19 changed the way that people interact with one another. And so it is very much the case that party conferences, political campaigns, you know, public meetings can now take place in a hybrid format. But even as infection rates have come down, you've also seen people return to these in-person gatherings. Exactly. Because at some level, people want to connect with each other. So I don't think women should be shoehorned into the space of only campaigning digitally if it's going to disadvantage them compared to, say, male candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think technology, again, should be used to amplify while not becoming something that we are slavishly sort of obsessed with to the detriment of our ability to connect with individuals on the human level. Okay. Um, the last question would be, how do we get more women into politics? Because... As I grow older, I realize that like, everything is determined by politics. As, as personally, I'm not a fan of politics because coming from a country like this where there's something new every day. But how do we get these young girls into politics? Because if we don't get them, then we will still continue having men making decisions for us 10 years from now, 20 mm. years from now. Yes. Well, I think the most important thing is to remember why we want women in politics. Mm -hmm. It's not an end unto itself. Mm -hmm. We want women in politics because they're currently underrepresented. Yeah. We want women in politics because politics and political leadership should reflect the diversity and the gender, particularly diversity of any country or region or continent. Um, and we want more women in politics because studies have shown that governments that have more women or countries that are led by women uh, tend to have lower levels of corruption, you know, um, lower levels of maternal mortality. There's a whole lot of correlations yes. between having women in public office um, and the outcomes, um, particularly with respect to governance. So it's not just a case of, you know, have, us having a bee in our bonnet about how, like, women must just be there. Um, it's, to re it's, to it's to redress and address a, a chronic um, underrepresentation, where women are, you know, fundamentally excluded from the space, and where the space seems to be desi designed to prevent them from advancing. Um, and then it's about making sure that we build, you know, political representation that is, in fact, representative of the people. And lastly, of course, um, there are benefits to this. And so, why should misogyny um, and, you know, people who are anti-gender equality, why should that stand in the way of societies being happier, being healthier, being more financially pro prosperous, being less corrupt? These are all outcomes that we want. And I think as societies, we should decide which is more important to us, you know, great governance outcomes or sexism against women. Thank you so much. What would, you, what would you be your parting shot? Um, well, my parting shot is that... Um, there is nothing about politics that is, you know, unsuited to women and young people. Mm -hmm. We deserve to lead. We belong in leadership. We belong in leadership now, not tomorrow. We're not the leaders of the future. We're the leaders of the present. And one of the areas that we need to step into is the public sector, which traditionally has been very hostile to these two groups. Um, but over time, we're seeing green shoots of progress in this, in this regard. And so we should do what we can. Um, to make sure that we run in large numbers and we win elections in large numbers. That's how we're going to transform the politics of this continent. And that's a phenomenon that should happen across political traditions, across political organizations, across countries and across regions. Thank you so much. And you remember that the majority of the voters are women. So we have a very high chance. So that's, uh, that's it for today. I hope you've, got, you've been enlightened like myself. See you in the next episode.